Hello, I'm Joe Balsamer. I'd like to welcome you to this special program featuring some of my favorite experiments that I use in my science classes. We'll get right to these experiments after this break. This summer, catch the spirit and find yourself in a state park. This experiment will show what causes an explosion. You've probably heard of explosions in grain elevators when fine particles of grain or dust or flour uh, explode. And if you have a room filled with fine dust or powder and someone comes in with a lighted cigarette, it's very easy to cause an explosion because the heat from the cigarette is hot enough to cause the particles in the room to reach their kindling temperature. That's the temperature at which they will take fire and burn, and you have an explosion. Now, in order to show that, I'm going to use a very, very fine powder called lycopodium powder. This powder is so fine that if I move it upside down or turn the jar upside down, it's going to look almost like a liquid the way it flows. This is really the spores of a plant which you probably know of as ground pine, and it's used very often in decoration, the ground pine plant. But these are the spores of it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a glass tube and I'm going to suck a little bit of this material up and then blow it into the Bunsen burner and show you that I can make a pretty reasonable explosion. I don't want to make too good a one because after all, we're in a classroom. So the first thing we'll do is attempt to light the Bunsen burner. We always remind students that when they light it, they should put the match at the very bottom of the opening. Then I'm going to take a little bit of the lycopodium powder. What I'll do is I'll pretend this is a straw and suck a little bit of it up. And then just simply blow it into the flame. And we have a pretty good little explosion. I can try it one more time. Almost like a flamethrower. In this experiment, we're going to break down sugar into its component parts using sulfuric acid. This experiment is very good to show that a compound such as sugar is made up of elements, and in many cases, the elements that make up the compound do not resemble it in any way, shape, or manner. You probably know that cane sugar is a carbohydrate, like starch and other types of sugars. And the reason we call it a carbohydrate is because it's made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And the ratio of hydrogen to oxygen is two to one. I've written the formula on the board, and I think you can see. This is the formula for cane sugar. Now, if you look at that very, very carefully, you can see that cane sugar is made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And the sulfuric acid will do something very, very interesting. Sulfuric acid has a strong affinity for water. That means that it will grab water no matter how it can because it just loves to grab water from compounds. It likes to combine with water. And what it's going to do is it's going to take this molecule and it's going to split it and grab, really, 11 molecules of water. And I could write it this way, 11 H2O. And it's going to produce so much heat that that water is going to change to steam and it's going to go up and you'll see it go up and what's going to be left is the plain carbon. And you recognize carbon because it's black. 
So once again, I'm going to add sulfuric acid to cane sugar. It's going to split the molecule and take off with the water in the form of steam and leave black carbon behind. Now, the way to do this, you don't really need an awful lot of sugar, so it's not a very expensive project. I'm just going to put a little bit of sugar in the beaker. And it works better if you just slightly wet the sugar with just make, almost make a paste of it. I wouldn't put a lot of water in it, but maybe a couple of drops of water, just enough to make a paste. That seems to get it going real well. I've made a little paste. And I'm going to take a little bit of concentrated sulfuric acid. It's the only one that works. It's concentrated sulfuric acid. And I'm going to put a little bit of it in the beaker, maybe just cover the sugar with it. And let's just watch what happens. Sometimes if you want it to happen more quickly, you might stir it with a stirring rod. But that's getting very, very hot. And the sulfuric acid now is reacting with the cane sugar taking off with the water molecules that make up the cane sugar. And you see that it is almost like the carbon is growing in the beaker. It's actually the carbon that's remaining in the beaker. And that's more or less what you see. Now, if you don't think that beaker is hot, you can, I'm not trying to be funny, but it's very, very hot. It's given off a lot of heat, and therefore we call it an exothermic reaction. This is a very good demonstration, again, for two, th two reasons. To show that you can break a compound down into the elements that make it up. And the second thing is to show what a strong affinity sulfuric acid has for water. Now, if you look at this compound, if I can grab the top of the beaker where it's not so hot, you can see that it's a solid. And it's the same material that you find when you burn your toast. It's pure carbon. A little bit of sulfuric acid is clinging to it, so I wouldn't recommend eating it or anything like that. But this is carbon, and it's very, very warm. It's so warm that I cannot put my hand on the beaker without burning it. And that concludes this demonstration. In this experiment, we're going to demonstrate how strong air pressure is. Now, you probably know that at normal atmospheric pressure, the pressure is 15 pounds per square inch pushing in and 15 pounds per square inch pushing out on this can. And because the pressure is equal, pushing in and pushing out, nothing happens to the can. In other words, what I'm saying is for every single square inch of this can, there is a pressure of 15 pounds pushing it in. And if I were inside the can for every single square inch, there would be 15 pounds of pressure pushing it out. So we say it that normal atmospheric pressure is 15 pounds per square inch. Now, in this experiment, I am going to reduce the air pressure inside the can. And when I do that, the atmospheric pressure pushing in is going to be greater than the atmospheric pressure pushing out, and the can should collapse inward. Now, the way I have to do it, and I have to go, I'm going to go, I'm going to do this in a roundabout way. What I'm going to do is take a little bit of water and place it at the bottom of the can and allow the water to boil to become steam. When the water becomes steam, the steam takes the place of the air and does the same job as the air. In other words, it pushes out with the same force as the air is pushing in and nothing happens. Then I'm going to take the can off the Bunsen burner and put a stopper on it, allow it to cool, and the steam will condense back to water. It won't take up very much room, and there'll be a part of the can that has a vacuum. And what will happen is the can will crush inward. Now, I'm saying that's going to happen. Let's see if it really does. First thing we'll do is light the Bunsen burner. And this piece of equipment that you see next to the Bunsen burner, it's called a tripod, and it's like a stand. And this is wire gauze so that we can rest something on it. And I'm going to turn the Bunsen burner on again. And I've already put the water in here. Now, it might take a few minutes for the, for the water to boil. 
and when the water boils, it again will change it, change to steam and actually force the air out and take the air's place. But while it's steam, it will behave just like air. It will be pushing the can out at about 15 pounds per square inch, just as the normal atmosphere is pushing the can in at about 15 pounds per square inch. The water seems to be boiling enough now, so what I will do is I will take the can, put it on the demonstration bench, and put this number five rubber stopper on it, and just wait and watch what happens. Meanwhile, I'll turn the burner off because we won't need it anymore. And I think you can hear it. And in a few minutes, hopefully, you'll be able to see it. Just make sure that the stopper is on as tight as it can go. And you, you will see some very interesting things happen. Again, now, what's happening is the steam is condensing and it's changing back to water and it's going to the bottom of the can. And on top of the can, the air can't get back in because the stopper is there, so there's nothing or a vacuum. And because the air pressure is greater on the outside than on the inside, what's going to happen is the can is going to collapse. And I think you can see it if I turn it around that it's already started to collapse. If, you if you're in a real hurry, what you do is run cold water over the can. But I, I much rather let it do it itself, uh, let nature take its course. And it makes for a a much more interesting demonstration. The students don't think you're rigging it. If you put water on it, there's all oh, he's fixing the experiment so it works anyway. It's really condensing now, and the air pressure is greater on the outside than it is on the inside. And it's just as though somebody sat or stepped on the can. If I take the can and hold it up, I think you can see that it's crushed on just about all sides. Now, the students will say, can you get it back to its original shape? And the answer is no, you really can't. You, you end up throwing the can out. Sometimes the vacuum will be so great that it will suck the stopper so far in that you can't even get the stopper back. But what I'm going to do is, if you listen very carefully, I'm going to take the stopper off and you'll hear the air rush in. It'll sound almost like opening a vacuum pack jar of coffee. Now you have to listen to this very carefully. You may, you may not even hear it. And now the air rushes back in. But of course, it's not strong enough to push the can back to its original position. This concludes the experiment. It's one of those days when everything goes wrong. It starts off bad and gets worse all day long. It's one of those days when you catch the blame for things you didn't do. It's one of those days when you need a friend Adopt your own good friend today. <laughs> this experiment makes use of gas tubes. And the reason they're important is because they show that when electricity bangs into a gas, it causes it to glow. And every single different gas will glow a different color. I'm going to use only three gas tubes, even though I have about 30 or 35 of them. Now, there are two reasons why we want to show this. First of all, we want to explain what causes the aurora borealis or the northern lights. Now, let's review what causes that to happen. What happens is particles from the sun bang into the Earth's atmosphere and cause the gases in the air to glow. And the reason you have all those different colors is because each gas glows a different color. Now, the reason that they occur in, towards the magnetic pole near Hudson Bay is because these particles that come from the sun are attracted by the Earth's magnetic pole. And we get more of them 
reaching the Earth when there is some sort of an explosion on the Sun. And the Sun has a lot of explosions. And we could talk about the Sun and some of its explosions or prominences on another occasion. But basically, this experiment will also explain why we see lightning. You know electricity is invisible and you can't see it, yet we can see lightning. Now let's see why we see lightning. What happens is the electricity moves from the earth to the cloud or between clouds or within a cloud. And as it moves, it bangs into the air and causes it to glow. That rapid expansion of air, because it's heated by the hot bolt of lightning, is what you and I call thunder. I thought I'd mention that because a lot of people associate thunder and lightning, and you can't have thunder without lightning. So thunder is the rapid expansion of air that results when it's heated rapidly by a bolt of lightning. Now the first tube that I'm going to demonstrate is a tube that has just air in it. Now this tube costs just as much as any other tube with any other gas. You might think it's less expensive because it has air in it, but it isn't. It's the same price if you have to buy them. Notice that it has an electrode on the top and an electrode on the bottom. And I'm going to put it in this particular device, which will force the current to go from one electrode to the other and bang into. And the current will bang into the gas that's in the tube and cause it to glow. Now, I'm going to use air in the first tube because I want you to see what lightning looks like. Most of us have seen lightning, but it doesn't last long enough to, for us to get a real good look at it. So I'm going to put this on the machine. I'm going to plug it in, and I'm going to turn it on, and you'll see it glow about the color that you might see lightning. We can do it and dim the lights a little bit, and I think you'll probably see it a little better. Now, look at the center of the tube. That's the color that we're most interested in. Not the top of the bottom, but the center. So that's what air looks like when it's banged into by electricity. Now, let's take another gas to show you that the gases do vary. We'll take this one off. I always like to unplug this just in case I forgot to turn the switch off, because you can get a pretty good shock if you don't. So I do both things. I turn the switch off and then plug it. Second one I'm going to use is hydrogen. And you'll notice that when I do it with hydrogen, we'll get a completely different color. And now I'm ready to do it with hydrogen. And if we turn the, dim the lights, I think you can see that we get a very, very striking color. This is pure hydrogen the same material that's in water. Remember, water is H2O. Now I'm going to try a third gas, and I turn the switch off, unplug it just to be sure. Be on, it's better to be safe than sorry. And I'm going to use neon. Neon, I'm sure you're familiar with, with neon signs. So we'll put the neon gas tube in. We'll plug it in and we're all set. And we get a very, very striking color. I'm sure you're very familiar with neon. It's one of the most commonly used gases in signs for various restaurants. And that concludes the demonstration. In this experiment, we're going to make a mercury barometer. As you probably know, a barometer is an instrument used to measure air pressure. The most accurate of all barometers are mercury barometers, but we don't generally encourage people to make them in schools because mercury is very poisonous. The only reason that I am doing this is because I'm making a videotape so that I can use this experiment in my classes by showing the videotape rather than repeating it. Now, the way we do it is we fill a tube that's closed on one side and opened on the other, obviously, with mercury. And we just use an ordinary medicine dropper for this. And why? the reason we have to fill it with mercury is that we want to get rid of all the air and just have 100% mercury. So I started this before the tape went on, but I'd like to conclude it and just show you exactly the way I did it. It's a little bit messy, so 
Uh, you have to have a little patience when you do it. But I'm going to try to get this completely filled with mercury, therefore removing all of the air. And once I get it completely filled with mercury, I'm going to invert it into a beaker of mercury and then release my finger the instant that it is below the level of the liquid. And no matter how many times I do it today, it will be at that level. Now the reason for that is that the atmospheric pressure today can only support a column of mercury up to that level. Now what is here where you don't see any mercury? That's a complete vacuum because remember I filled it completely to remove all the air so that that's not air, that's a vacuum. That's one of the reasons why this tube is so thick to withstand that vacuum. Now if I want to measure the barometric pressure, you just use a ruler and I'm sure you're familiar with the way we read barometric pressure. We take the ruler and we see how high the atmosphere can support a column of mercury. And today, it's just around 30 inches. You might not be able to see that from where you are, but what we're saying, in other words, that the barometric pressure is about 30 inches, or another way of saying it is that the air in this room is able to support a column of mercury 30 inches up the tube. Now, the way it works is that the air is pushing on the surface of the mercury, and it's forcing the mercury to go up the tube. Now, I could do this a hundred times today, and I'll still get the same level. Now, if I want to remove the air to show you what happens when the air pressure gets less, you know that the barometer goes down. You've heard the weatherman say the barometer is falling or the barometer is rising. Actually, what causes the barometer to rise is when the air becomes cold and dry. Cold air weighs more than warm air, and dry air weighs more than wet air. On the other hand, when the barometer falls, the air is either warming up or getting filled with moisture. Warm air weighs less than cold air, and moist air weighs less than dry air. That's why when we have a storm, especially a tropical storm that's warm and humid with a lot of rain, the pressure falls very, very low. I'm going to show you what happens when I decrease the pressure. I'm going to take this mercury barometer that I've just made, and I'm going to put it on top of my vacuum pump, and I'm going to put a bell jar over it, and then pump the air out of it, and you'll see the barometer fall as the air is pumped out of it. It's kind of a tall bell jar, so I have to be careful with it. I put a little grease at the bottom of the bell jar to ensure a tight seal. Now, I will turn on the vacuum pump, and you'll see that as the air is pumped out, the barometer will fall. In fact, I might even be able to get that pressure so low that it's lower than what you'd get in most tornadoes. Let me just see now how low I can get that pressure today. Depends really on how good a seal I have. If I've got a real good seal, I can get a real low pressure. And I'm about four inches. So in other words, the pressure right now is four inches of mercury. It never gets that way in nature. If it did, buildings would explode outward, similar to what you'd experience in a tornado. I'm not really sure how low a pressure gets in a tornado, and I'm not sure anyone knows, but I, I, I am sure that if the pressure outside the building got that low, four inches of mercury, the building would explode out because the pressure inside is close to 30 inches of mercury, and because the pressure pushing out is greater than the pressure pushing in, we get that explosion of buildings, such as you've probably seen in some of the more popular tornado films. Now if I turn the vacuum pump off, and allow the air to go back in, the air presses on the surface of the mercury and causes it to move up the tube, and I'm back to where I started. Now, I could leave this here for the rest of the year, and I would have a wonderful instrument called a mercury barometer. But you probably know that if I wanted to transport that to another room or to another laboratory, it would be very awkward. It'd be a good chance that I'd break the tube 
and the mercury would spill all over the place. And mercury is very, very difficult to pick up if you spill it. You have to use sort of a suction device to pick it up. Plus, it's poisonous. The fumes are poisonous, so you don't want to get it all over the classroom. So scientists have come out with a very, very accurate barometer called an aneroid barometer. Not as accurate as the mercury, but it's set with the mercury barometer. Now, really, what is it? It's made up of two tin cans in which some of the air has been removed. Actually, it's like two tin can covers that are welded together. And there's a little bit of air inside or in between the two covers of these two tin cans. Or well, when the pressure goes up, naturally the air is going to press on the two covers of the two tin cans and cause the needle to go up. And when the pressure goes down, not as much pressure is going to be pushing on the two covers and the needle is going to go down. And what we do on the back of these, there's a little bit of, a, there's a screw that you can adjust it so it will read exactly like your mercury barometer. We calibrate those maybe once or twice a week. Now, if we put a pen on an aneroid barometer and put ink in the pen and attach a chart to it and make the pen right on the chart, we have an aneroid barometer that's called a barograph, which is a recording barometer. I hope you have enjoyed the series of experiments that we have just performed. If you have any experiment that you'd like to see done, or if you have any questions about science, please feel free to write to us at Warner Cable.